Monsters is a podcast about the worst human beings on the planet. The episodes of this podcast deal with murder, dismemberment, torture, rape, child abuse, and mental illness. Please turn back while you still can. Listener discretion advised. On August 28, 2014, Timothy Jones Jr. found his six-year-old son, Natan, tampering with an electrical outlet in their Red Bank, South Carolina home. According to Jones, in an attempt to find out what the boy was doing, he punished his son by forcing him to do strenuous exercise in the form of squats and push-ups before giving up and sending him to bed. Jones claims, when he went to check on Natan a few hours later, he discovered that he was dead in his bed. When faced with what to do next, given the options that he had, he chose to strangle his other four children, ages one through eight, before fleeing his home. This is Monsters. Come back and find out that he's deceased. Tapping me on the head, telling me I'm cheating, telling me I'm, you know, let me see your phone. Just kill her and she died. I think Diego Campione is totally in the wrong, and I hope he burns in hell for all his sins. Hell's not a very fun place. I only have two hands. I'm that four hand girl. I'm two hands. And I don't know. Just, just get escalated and escalated. <laughs> In the first season of Monsters, we bring you stories of filicide. The act of a parent killing their own children is one of the most horrific things anyone can experience. You created a life, they were part of you, yet you just erased them like they were worthless, oftentimes discarding the body as if it were garbage. Sometimes I feel like calling these people monsters is too good for them. Filicide is defined as the act of a parent killing their own child who is up to 18 years old. Infanticide is a specific type of filicide that's defined as the act of a parent murdering their own child who is specifically up to one year old. Similarly, neonaticide is the act of a parent killing their own child within the first 24 hours of a child's life. When Timothy Jones Jr. was pulled over at a traffic safety checkpoint while driving in Mississippi, he was arrested for driving while under the influence and for possession of synthetic marijuana. When the officer approached the vehicle, she said she could smell the odor of decomposition. When she searched the SUV, she found a large bleach stain, blood, maggots, and children's clothes. The deputies ran the plate and discovered that there was a nationwide alert saying that he and his five children had been missing for a week. Jones was taken to the station in Mississippi for questioning, where the authorities back in South Carolina were finally able to question him. It was during this interview by an FBI agent and a Lexington County Sheriff's detective where he confessed to murdering all five of his children. In the taped confession, he explained that on August 28, 2014, he had found that one of his kids had broken an electrical outlet in their home. His six-year-old son, Natan, had tampered with an outlet and caused some damage. Jones was questioning him about what had happened, but wasn't getting a straight answer, so he claims that he, quote, worked him hard, end quote, with PT. What he meant was that he made the boy do strenuous physical activity as a form of punishment, specifically squats and push-ups. He continued this for about an hour along with, quote, cracking him on the butt, end quote, a few times to try to get an answer from him. Um, we talked about when you picked your children up Thursday, which would have been um, August 28th. You picked them up from school that day, and something happened that night. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, can, can you walk us through what happened? I questioned a ton about four outlets that he blew. After a series of not getting any favorable responses out of him, I tried to use more harsh measures to just try to get out of him what was going on because I didn't know what he was doing. I seen four destroyed outlets. Uh, is it for me, him? Was he curious? I just didn't know what was going on. I was trying to make sense of it. I worked him too hard or maybe it was a combination of the electricity. I know electricity takes electrolytes out of your body. Uh, something happened. Mm -hmm. It was out of the ordinary and he wouldn't tell me. If I would have known it, I mean, I, I would have gotten medical help and whatnot, but I don't know what he did and he didn't tell me. I didn't see any burn marks on his body, so that's why I didn't rush him to the hospital. So after the fact, he, he 
he was deceased. And then what, what happened to him? What, how, how did he get deceased? What, what did you do? I sent him to bed after I worked him real hard because he wouldn't answer me. And, and what, what do you mean by working him too hard? I just PT'd his ass till he couldn't handle it. I tried to crack him more butt a couple times to get something out of him to tell me what was he doing. Right. What's his motive? And when you say PT, and what, what are we talking about? Squats and push-ups. Squats, push-ups. And how, how long were you having him PT? I'm going to PT like an hour. Like I said, there's nothing out of the ordinary. Those kids would do insanity with and, me. We had fun doing it. And where did he go from, you're doing this, where in the house? Where are you PT? This was in the living room, and then I finally got tired of him and sent him to bed. Okay. Tired to bed. You're not telling me the truth. I can't help you. Go to bed, man. You're wasting everybody's time. He claims that he didn't get any explanation from his son, so he gave up and sent him to bed. A few hours later, he went into Natan's room where he found the boy deceased. And then, and then you, you find out what? I come back and find out that he's deceased. And when I find out he's deceased, then the shit hits the fan and all. How does the shit hit the fan, Tim? The voices start going off, and then here comes the paranoia. Oh shit! What just happened? What what what, what just happened? This ain't gonna go. I can't call them. But I got all these voices running through my head now. And then what happens, Tim? <sighs> what did you tell us earlier? So Natan was was dead, and then what happened? And then I followed suit with the other four. And how did how did you so feel? That was with my hands. With your hands? Can you describe what you mean by with your hands? Around their neck. Around their neck? Okay. <laughs> who, who was next? I'm just going to put the order so I don't have to go into too much detail. Okay. Just, just tell us right. the order. Natan, Mira, Elias, Gabriel. Wait, wait, wait. Natan, Eli, Mira, Gabriel, Eli. <laughs> and when did you say this was, Tim? What date? You told us earlier. Thursday, I think. They were supposed to go to school Friday and they didn't go because, well, they couldn't go. Yeah. And you said also that this happened where? At the house. Can you tell me what that address was? What county is that in, Tim? Lexington, South Carolina. Lexington, South Carolina? Okay. What, where in the house did you say this happened at? In, in the house? The bedroom, or not bedroom, the, the living room. Okay. This is where he claims the voices started to go off in his head. Quote, what just happened? You can't call 911, end quote. Most likely, a conscious attempt to set up an insanity defense. He said he got paranoid and proceeded to kill his other four kids. He strangled two of them, eight-year-old Mara and seven-year-old Elias, with his bare hands. He said his hands were too big, so he used a belt to strangle two-year-old Gabriel and one-year-old Elaine. He claims that he did it in order to send all of the children to heaven together. Prosecutors asserted that he did it out of spite so that his ex-wife, Amber Kaiser, wouldn't receive custody of the kids. Natan Jones, six years old, died at his father's hands in a fit of rage. Malice. It's for you to decide. Did Tim Jones, when he saw his son collapse, did he call 911? Did he call for help? No. He did. Did he call the children's mom and tell her? No, he didn't. Did he call his father? No. Did he call anyone? <laughs> no. What he did was he thought, I'm screwed. No one's going to believe this is an accident. And what did he do next? He strangled his son, Elias, seven years old, to death with his bare hands. He strangled his daughter, Mira, eight years old, with his hands. He took a belt to the babies crossing their throats and taking the life away from them and strangled both of them, Gabe and Abigail, to death. He knew what he did was wrong. That's why he didn't call 911. He knew what he did was wrong. 
That's why he ran. He ran to try and save himself. <laughs> and he hated his ex-wife so much that he killed the children so she'd never get to see him again. Timothy Jones was bitter that his ex-wife had left him, and especially that she had had an affair with a 19-year-old neighbor before she left. By the time of the trial, authorities were convinced that Natan was killed in some manner out of anger from his father. Once all of the children were dead, he put the bodies into the back of his Cadillac Escalade and covered them with sheets and, quote, a shitload of air fresheners, end quote. When authorities searched his internet history, they found that he had spent the next few days searching for countries with no extradition laws and instructions on how to dissolve a body. Authorities also found lists he had made that ordered how he was going to dispose of the bodies. One note says, Head to campground. Melt bodies, exclamation point. Sand bones to dust or small pieces. Discard by sanitation plant. Another he had written, Day one, burn up bodies. Day two, sand down bones. Day three, M, B, smiley face, dissolve plus discard. Investigators asked him about these lists during his confession, and he said he was trying to come up with a plan to cut up the bodies and burn or dissolve them, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. I think originally I intended to go do all that stuff that I wrote down on the paper, but Which then I couldn't what? bring myself to it. I right? Was to, I what was it? To do stuff to get rid of the corpse. Do you remember what step one was? You know, like dissolve them or something like that. I was going to cut them up. And you were gonna, I was going to do all kinds of stuff. Did you write down that you were going to burn the bodies? I think I was going to burn them, yeah. And you were going to, what was step two? Boil them or I forget what it was. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I don't remember everything. Yep. Yeah. Did you write that you were going to... Um, I wrote stuff down that it was in the context of that time, but... All right. Was it something that you were going to uh, cut the bodies up? So I could bring myself to do, yes. All right. Let's... We went over this. What? What is day one? Burn up bodies. What's day two? Saw down bones. What's day three? MB smiley face. Dissolve. Dissolve and discard. Okay, so your initial plan was to do these things with, with their bodies. What was one of them? I told you there's other stuff. That just happened to be the one that's materialized. I had a million thoughts going through Okay, me. let's go over this. This is what? Head to the campground, no bodies, and send bodies to dust your small. By small discard by a sanitation plant. Okay, so these are some of the things that were going through your head? That was, that's just a small amount of stuff that was going through my head, yes. Did you write this before or after you killed the children? After. After? I wasn't premeditating this, no. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find anything that clears up what MB stands for or why there's a smiley face drawn next to it. He left the bodies in his vehicle for seven days while he went to the hardware store to purchase dust masks, various saws, and muriatic acid. He also went to a dollar store to buy trash bags to use to dispose of the bodies. This receipt is going to be from Augusta Road in West Columbia. Okay. All right. And the date here is 9-3. So this is this is after because what happened to the children was on Thursday. What day was that? Is that 28th. correct? That's the twenty eighth. That makes sense. Now nine three. This is on Wednesday, so this is after the weekend. And where have them children been the whole time? With me. Where? Drive around a vehicle, I think. What, where are they though? They're with me in the car. Okay. They're all in the back. Yes. Okay. Well, in the middle, not back. So back implies the sorry. Back implies the back where you open it. Uh, and you, saw, and you told me earlier they were you had them covered up in some sheets or blankets. Yeah, I do blankets and a shitload of air freshener. So you have you have their bodies there. You go and and you purchase what? Walk me through what you're purchasing here. Uh, I don't know what it rose. All right. What's this? Uh, a dust mask. This is actually Gatorade, but oh. dust mask. Some goggles and some hand saws. Some jab saw, it says. And a multi saw. Multi saw. What's this here? 
Uh, some muriatic acid. And what's this here? I think a five gallon pail. All right. Were you purchasing this stuff at that time because you initially thought you might be able to go through with this? Partially, and then I couldn't bring myself. You, you just couldn't do it. Okay. So one of the next receipts we kind of talk about is going to be several days later. I had um, these thoughts in my head to try to do this, and then I couldn't bring myself to do it. Okay. Now we go to the following day. This is going to be the fourth. This is at the Dollar General store, and we're still in Orangeburg, South Carolina. What do you purchase there that we spoke about? <coughs> Excuse me. What's this here? Some bad trash bags. Trash bags. Why'd you buy those trash bags? <laughs> to do what now? Put the bodies. Put the bodies in. Okay, but then to throw some of my own trash out too. Okay. I had a lot of stuff in the vehicle I was trying to throw out. I find it very interesting how he goes from nearly inaudibly saying he was going to use the trash bags to dump the bodies, to snapping right out of it to explain that he also had some other trash to throw away. He's supposedly crying about putting his children's corpses into trash bags, to matter-of-factly explaining how he had a lot of other trash to throw out. In my opinion, none of the times he cries sound genuine. Jones then started driving around aimlessly, stopping periodically to buy synthetic marijuana, a product called Scooby Snacks. He finally made the decision to go to Las Vegas, and while passing through Alabama, he dropped the five dead bodies that he had been traveling with in a remote logging area. The bodies were each in black trash bags and dumped in the woods like garbage. He tells the investigators how he started trying to cut up Natan's body, but couldn't bring himself to go through with it. All I'm saying from that Thursday, though, the 28th, and you say after all this happens, you place their bodies in the vehicle. Yes. Between then and the time you come with, uh, in contact with the officer, and that would be Friday on September 5th. So we have over a week's time that has passed by. Your children are still, still in the vehicle. Is that correct? What date? Friday. When you, you have contact yeah, with so the law? Yeah, so the next Saturday was, yeah. Okay, so they're in the vehicle the whole time. What's kind of happening in the vehicle? As far as, how does it smell in there? Stinks like shit. What, what's happening with the children? You were telling me before. Well, I just, what? I, the blood was probably just coming out of their bodies because I just left them in there. And mm -hmm. I believe that, well, as far as I know, I think when your body dies, you, well, blood and water separate. I think that's... Now, we, we had asked because you purchased the saws and everything, had you used any of the saws on your children? I think I tried to start on that time and I couldn't bring myself to do it. Okay. And we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to where that happens. Had you tried with any of the other children? Mm -mm. No? With that in mind, can you describe to me what you were telling me earlier about where you disposed of your children at? They're in some wooded road log truck looking thing off on the side in bags. Was it a two lane road that this was off of? I think so, but I'm not 100% okay. sure. You said it was a heavily wooded area? Uh, it was heavily wooded. It looked like if you went up in the area where I did, it was either like some of the trees got knocked out of the way, like people potentially either starting to clear it or maybe somebody came through there and was bulldozing up ATV path or something. I don't know. It was, okay. wasn't something that was incorporated. That's kind of what I was saying. It was unincorporated. Unincorporated. Your children, you, you do what once you, once you get to this location? Put them in the bags and put them off to the side. Okay. Tell us about Natan. Does this happen there? Or did this happen in a separate place where you, well, you, you said you, you started to cut him? You started to happen there. Where, where did it happen? In the vehicle? Outside of the vehicle? Outside of the vehicle. And what do you do? I began to try to saw a leg and I couldn't bring myself to finish it. So how, oh, I can't do that. How, how far did you get? Maybe about that far in. I was like, I can't do that. I can't do that to him. Okay. So you, him. you did not cut his leg off? No. What, what did you do with his body? I just put him in a bag. He said, I gotta sit you guys over there. I said a prayer for him and walked away. Okay. Did you place each child in, in a separate bag? And then did you walk them a couple at a time or one at a time? What, which, which is it? A couple at a time. A couple at a time? Uh, however many trips it took to get five of them over there. He only made it to Mississippi before he was pulled over at a routine traffic checkpoint and arrested. 
everything that Timothy Jones Jr. had done up to this point was to at least minimize his responsibility for the murders of his children. Whether he was trying to get away with it altogether, or at least delay the inevitable, I believe his ultimate goal was always to receive the least amount of punishment. Once taken into custody, I think the insanity defense becomes his next attempt at evading punishment. Throughout the interrogation, he brings up voices numerous times. At that point, I was just running on fear, and I wasn't thinking. Any normal person would have said, let me call the police and just turn myself in. Okay. I took the coward route and started following those voices in my head, which led me down such a nice path I'm on today. He also describes how the Scooby Snacks help calm the voices and that he needs to see a doctor. Now, you were telling us that was actually in the car. It was not Spice, but they are called... It's the Scooby Snacks. Okay. You said and, locally in Lexington County, you bought those from where? Uh, Time Warp. Time Warp. And, and what do they kind of do for you? They calm the voices down inside my head to All let right. me be at peace and not act on them. They kind of give you the same um, high as, 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 as what drug? As, I think you're talking about the tea. Yeah. It, it's like marijuana in the sense that it gives you a high, but it's not the high that I'm looking for. It's the effect of quieting this. It's medication. I know that sounds stupid as hell, no, but no, no, no. it's why I need to see a doctor. Okay. We'll go through these. We, absolutely, yeah. Throughout the interrogation, he also mentions multiple times that he believed Natan was trying to get him somehow. At the end of the interrogation, they ask Jones a series of basic questions. Some are questions that cover the investigator in the event that the subject decides to no longer cooperate. Did we force you to say anything? Do you understand where you are? Stuff like that. Other questions are most likely used by psychologists to evaluate the subject's mental state. How did you feel about your kids? And even, would you have committed this crime even if a uniformed officer was standing next to you? The answer to these questions confirm his paranoia about Natan and possibly all of the children. What did you think about your children, just in general? I think that they were going to have issues like me. Issues like you? Okay. I what? think that they were going to have issues from not only from a broken home, I think that there's genetic diseases that... That's, that, I think that there were some things that my dad, if uh -huh. you guys had seen yesterday, he doesn't know about my mom. Yeah. I think that there's things I know about my mom, even though I'm not... I wasn't around when that happened because I think I've got some of what she has. What kind of people do you think the children were when you committed the crime? I understand this is a weird question for what we're talking about, but we, we had to ask it earlier, too. I think they were conspiring. I think they were conspiring against you? I definitely, it seems to make the most sense to me. I mean, why else would somebody go do something like that and not tell me what he's doing? Would you have done this if a uniformed officer had been standing next to you? Yes. Even I wouldn't have cared, no man, because elbow to elbow with you, you would have still I wouldn't have this. cared, yeah. And here's why. At that point in time I didn't care because I saw myself as a damn target. And I saw him as having the gun in his hand, if you will. I know he was a kid, but that's how I saw it like shit. He's and when you say me. when you say him, you're talking about Natan. Natan. And how old is Natan? Six years old. Six years old. If Timothy Jones Jr. is suffering from any sort of mental illness, it's more likely that it's paranoia. These statements make it more likely that he was willing to kill Natan somehow out of anger due to his paranoia that the boy was out to get him than it is that he just overworked him and the boy just died in his sleep from exhaustion or dehydration. The bodies were badly decomposed when they were found, so the autopsy was inconclusive. It's just as possible that Jones had an argument with his son that led him to beating or strangling him to death. This would also explain why he would kill the rest of his children and go on the run. If he dialed 911, they would definitely arrest him for killing Natan in that scenario. If Natan had died of natural causes induced by strenuous activity, it would be unlikely that he was punished severely, if at all. His final statement is what really seals the deal that everything that was done by Timothy Jones Jr. was done for self-preservation. At the end of the interrogation, especially after a crime like this, they need to ensure as best they can that Jones is not a suicide risk. You say you're not suicidal at all. If I was gonna if I was gonna do it, it would have already happened. No, man, I'm not willing to take that. 
I'll do a lot of stuff, but... Because you said your religious beliefs. Taking my know. life is not one of them. Because what happens? You say if you kill yourself... If you kill yourself... Well, maybe nothing does happen, and maybe... Lord, I love you. Maybe God's a myth, and we die, and we go to the ground. But if he's not, and it's real... Well, if, if it does what it says... Hell's not a very fun place. I don't think it plans on freezing over anytime soon. I don't want to go there. He claims that he would not commit suicide because he would never do anything to chance going to hell, which makes sense for someone who has been described as a religious fundamentalist. He can ask for forgiveness for the murder of his five children. He can't, however, ask for forgiveness for suicide. He believes that he's going to pray away his sin and still go to heaven when he dies. This is the perfect example of why Timothy Jones Jr. did everything that he did to save Timothy Jones Jr. Some people ask why he had custody of all five of his children. His ex-wife, Amber Kaiser, tells the jury in Jones' sentencing hearing that the relationship began well enough, but eventually things started going downhill. She didn't want the kids to see the tension between them, so she called it quits. In the beginning, Tim and I had a very strong relationship. I, I think we found a lot in common. Um, I wasn't speaking to my family at the time, and I'm not sure if he was really speaking to his at the time when we first met. And we just kind of latched onto each other. Um, later on, um, any little thing would, would kind of spark an argument and our relationship became volatile, uh, not just on Tim's side, on mine as well. Um, it got aggressive at times, violent. Um, and, but we, we managed to stick through it uh, because we had the children. Um, towards the end of our marriage, I think I was thinking in the best interest for my children that it was not a good environment. It was not something that children need to be seeing. Um, so we separate ourselves. She claims that when she divorced Jones, he left and shut off the power. She was unable to care for the children, so she made him the primary caretaker because that's what she thought was best for the kids. She still had rights involving the children, but Jones was the primary. She said that Jones was a good father, and since he had a good paying job, the kids would be better off with him full time. Tim initially left uh, me and, and turned my power off and and stuff, and I found it really hard because I just had nothing to offer my children. Um, I could not provide for them. I think as a mother, I was making the best choice that I could. <laughs> I trusted my husband at the time because he gave me no reason not to with my children. He was a good father while we were married. He promised to take care of them. Um, we co-parented pretty good towards the end. Um, I think that's what took me back a little bit. I, I, I'm really sorry that everybody has to sit here for this. I don't think anybody saw this coming and I know between myself and, and members of the Jones family themselves, I know if anybody had seen anything that we, any of us, any one of us would have done something about it. So we wouldn't, wouldn't be in this position today. It wasn't until the prosecution questioned her, though, that she described the horrible abuse she had faced at the hands of her ex-husband. You spoke a little bit a few moments ago about some of the violence. There was an incident here in Lexington County, I believe, that you actually reported to the police. Would it be the 18-wheeler? Can you tell us about that? Tim and I were leaving uh, Walmart, and we had gotten into an argument, and he said, hey, let's just play chicken then, you know, in a more stern, argumentative tone. And I said, Tim, it's not funny. It's not effing funny. It's not effing funny. We had the kids in the back seat. So an 18 wheeler was coming this way and Tim steered the car where the 18 wheeler would hit me directly. 
And as we were driving toward the 18 wheeler, we, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't much of a distance at all. And Tim jerked the car that way and just started laughing about it. Like it was funny. Um, and I know he remembers that one. I did report that. Uh, it scared me. My children were in the, in the car. Um, had that 18 wheeler hit, it would have killed. It would have killed everybody in the car. Is that the only incident that happened during the marriage? No. Were there Tim, times you laid hands on you physically? Yes. And you have since informed law enforcement about those times as well, correct? I did. Um, one incident in particular, we were arguing. I, I can't remember what it was about. But Tim grabbed me by the side of my head and headbutted me to the point where I just blanked out. And when I got up, it was kind of what just, what just happened. Um, but I could feel my head kind of jar, my brain jar in my skull. Um, and shortly after that, he threw a phone at my face and broke my back teeth out. He played chicken with an 18-wheeler on the highway while his family was in the car. He once head-butted her until she blacked out. He hit her with a phone and knocked out her back teeth. This sounds like a violent person, so why would children be better off with him? She seemed to think that the kids were safe because his rage had only ever been directed at her. In a situation that involves domestic abuse, the spouse being abused will generally develop a low opinion of themselves. It's obvious from her statements that she saw herself as not good enough for the kids. She thought that she was what was making Jones angry, and by leaving, his violent outbursts would go away. She didn't realize that Jones was just a violent person, and once she was gone, his anger would be taken out on the children. At the end of her testimony, the prosecution reinforced their claim that Jones did not want their mother to have custody of the children. Amber his statements to you, you call him making statements that you would never have the children, that they would never live with you? He had many times, numerous times. He's made that statement on more than one occasion. Yes. I would say, Tim, what have I done as a parent? I mean, the, the court didn't find anything wrong with me as a parent. I had joint custody. I chose, as a mother, what I thought was the most responsible thing with making him prim primary custodial parent. I obtained a car, I obtained a license, I got a management job, and I got my high school diploma, all to prove to the system that I was a good enough parent. Um, it just wasn't good enough for Tim, and it never was going to be good enough for Tim. Timothy Jones Jr. did not want his children to live with their mother. That was clear. The statements that you would never had the children, Amber. He's told you that on more than one occasion? Yes, ma'am, he did. Nothing further. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but the jury didn't buy it. The prosecutor did a good job of laying out what it meant to be not guilty by reason of insanity. He's charged with five counts of murder. <coughs> He's pled not guilty by reason of insanity, as you heard your honor say. For you all to find that, you have to find that the defense has proved to you by a preponderance of evidence that when he killed his children, he did not understand the legal right from the legal wrong or the moral right from the moral wrong at the time he killed his children. They're going to do that by presenting experts. And I'm expecting you'll hear testimony from a bunch of experts to tell you pieces and parts about why he's not responsible. Maybe it's because somehow of him using the drugs. The voluntary drug use isn't an excuse. Maybe it's because he had a traumatic brain injury because he had a car wreck when he was a kid. Maybe they're gonna say he has some kind of mental illness But even if any of those are true, even if you believe any of those, that doesn't mean he's insane. That's not insanity. There's more to it. 
every expert, I ask you all to think about two questions when they're testifying, whether they're ours or whether they're defense. Is that expert searching for the truth? Are they trying to give you the truth or are they looking for a defense or an excuse? Ask those hard questions in your head. Listen to their answers. Is the information they're providing you, is it coming from verifiable facts, things we know, things we can see, or is it only coming from what Tim Jones tells them? Those are the two things I ask that you all remember every time an expert testifies. You'll also hear from a court-appointed independent psychiatrist from the state. He'll tell you that Tim Jones was sane. He knew right from wrong when he killed his children. You'll hear from people who knew him and saw him. And tell you, they'll tell you what they observed at his behavior. We have, the state, has a burden of proving murder. The unlawful killing of another with malice aforethought. Killing of another with malice. And the judge will tell you all what malice is. It can be hostility. It can be hatred. It can be ill will. It can be a wicked or depraved spirit. An evilness in your heart. That's what you're looking for, and that's what we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to you. How are we going to do that? How are we going to prove to you that he had evil in his heart and evil on his mind when he killed those children? It'll be from the words that he told the police, and listen for the truth in the words. It'll be his actions in killing and how he killed his children. It'll be the fact that he ran and he tried to hide. It'll be in the way that he thought of to dispose the bodies of his children and how he actually did. It'll be in his deception of the way he lies to people to cover up his crimes. It'll be his thoughts. You'll actually get to see his thoughts in his cell phone because it recorded his web searches, his internet history, and you'll get to see what he was doing and what he was thinking about starting on the 28th until the time he was caught. <clears throat> you're, all gonna, you're also going to see it on a clipboard that was found with writing in the car when he was stopped by the police in Mississippi. A detailed list of how he planned to dispose of his children's bodies. You'll see evidence of malice. Be on the lookout for it. Every time Tim Jones made a choice, starting on August 28, 2014, with his son Natan, it was all about him. What was going to happen to Tim Jones? How was it going to affect him? What did he need to do to protect himself? No thoughts for his children. In an insanity plea, the defendant has to have not understood that what they were doing was wrong. There are stories of people who commit murder in a public place and then just go on about their day with no concern of getting caught. They are eventually arrested in a daze, and this could be a crime that you might try with an insanity plea. The prosecutor explains how Jones caused the death of Natan, and every decision he made from that point forward was made to protect himself. Looking up instructions on how to dissolve a body, looking up what countries have no U.S. extradition, fleeing, hiding the bodies, these are all examples of Timothy Jones Jr. trying to not get caught for a crime he knew very well was wrong. The defense claimed that he had undiagnosed schizophrenia and that his wife's infidelity and subsequent divorce made him unstable. He uses a very strange analogy to try to explain why Jones would be considered insane. You can't judge the health of a forest by only looking at a few trees. You can't judge the health of a forest by only looking at a few trees. I've got a friend who works at the Forestry Commission. He always says, 
You can't judge the health of a forest by only looking at a few trees. That is what the state is going to ask you to do in this trial, is to just look at a few trees. They're not going to ask you to look at the seeds that the forest was planted with. They're not going to ask you to test the soil to see if the foundation of that forest is poor. They're not going to ask you to go to the right and see that disease has decimated the forest. They don't want you to go to the left and see that kudzu has overtaken that part of the forest, destroying it. They certainly don't want you to sniff the air because you might get a whiff of smoke and realize that the back of that forest is on fire. You heard the judge say that Tim has pled not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, it's not a defense that Tim picked out, like when you were in Bordier and the judge read you a list of defenses. That is a defense that the lawyers, in consultation with experts, a full examination of Tim and a review of his family history. Tim has schizophrenia, something he wasn't diagnosed with prior to his arrest. Tim's mind is broken. In deciding whether Tim knew the legal or moral right from wrong, you need to look at the full forest, not just a few trees. Tim was genetically loaded for mental illness. Children come into this life with genetic predispositions. Some genes determine your hair and your eye color. Other genes can influence diseases, such as diabetes or heart disease. Other genes can determine vulnerability to psychiatric conditions, such as addiction, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. Tim's mom has schizophrenia. She has been institutionalized for the last two decades. You will hear about major mental illness on both the paternal and the maternal side of Tim's family. The seeds for Tim's brain aren't healthy. His argument is completely irrelevant, though. The question is not whether or not Timothy Jones Jr. suffers from mental illness. A lot of people in the world suffer from mental illness and don't commit any crime. I have a very strong family history of mental illness, and I myself have been diagnosed with mental illness, something I take medication for. And if I murdered my children, my guilt would not be based on the fact that I have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Just like the Jones case, it would be based on whether or not I knew the difference between right or wrong while committing the crime. The defense attorney uses this tree analogy to try to prove that Jones simply has mental illness. That's not what needs to be proven. He needs to prove that Jones didn't know right from wrong at the time of the murder, something he clearly tries to show during the interrogation, but his actions say otherwise. The analogy itself is flawed. The prosecution is not looking at just one tree. They look at the seeds and see past anger against Natan. They look to the right and see Jones looking up non-extradition countries. They look to the left and see Jones writing down notes about how to dispose of a body. They look at the soil and see Jones telling his ex-wife that she will never get custody of their children. They sniff the air and smell the decomposition in his car as he flees the scene and dumps the bodies. The jury found him guilty on all counts, plus the special circumstance that would sentence him to the death penalty. As to indictment 2015 GS 320188-0189-0190-0191-0195, the state versus Timothy Ray Jones Jr. We, the jury, unanimously agree on the existence of an aggravating circumstance. Two or more persons were murdered by the defendant by act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct in the murder of a small child under the age of, under the age of 11 or younger. And it is so signed by the four person.
We, the jury, in the above entitled case, have found beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following statutory aggravating circumstances. To wit, two or more persons were murdered by the defendant by act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct and the murder of five children 11 years of age or younger. Now I recommend to the court that the defendant, Timothy R. Jones, Jr., <clears throat> be sentenced to death. The judge set an execution date of November 30th, 2019, but the defense team was already set to file an appeal. The appeals process is what keeps most inmates on death row for multiple decades. Either way, he will never be released from prison. He will die there. I sent a letter to Timothy Jones Jr. just to ask him about his opinion on suicide and whether or not he thought he was deserving of going to heaven, even though he murdered his children. He responded, but said that his lawyer told him he's not allowed to speak to anybody about his case.